early in the session. What we plan on doing today is we have 12 testifiers, 10 of them are parents, uh, various places in the state, various capacities, and uh, to talk about the uh, school closings and how they're doing and, and um, what it is they're looking for. We ask them to keep it about uh, no more than five minutes. That's important. <laughs> then at the end we have, uh, I hope you all got the, the agenda. We did it electronically. Hope it all worked out for everybody on the committee. Then we have uh, Jensen and uh, Dr. Jensen and Dr. Delalisi. I hope I got that right. Yep. No, you got it right. You got it perfect. Thank you, right. Chairman. Thank so, you. So they'll come on at the end and kind of wrap up with some information and data. The primary purpose is to listen to these parents and some others to talk about some of the issues. After every um, uh, three or so uh, testifiers, we'll stop and have ask some questions. Have have members ask questions. The agenda, as you see, if you got it, will take us to about 4.15 as it is. So we'll have some time for a few questions from everybody to as we, uh, you know, every three or so testifiers. Um, many people have not, uh, that are on this have not testified before. So before we go any further, um, why don't we do this quick. Uh, coming up next week on Monday, we'll, we'll uh, do a more formal in, in, uh, um, introduction of our amazing staff. I think all of you are aware of them, Jenna and Anna Marie and, and <clears throat> Betsy. And where is the, who did I forget? Jenna, Anna Marie, but Jenna, Jenna, Anna Marie, Betsy. That's it. Yeah, you're used to four. I'm used to four. Jenna, Anna Marie, and Betsy. I thought there was another one. Anyway, so they're great. They're wonderful. Been around a while. They know their stuff. And I know Anna Marie's never stumped she uh, had to look up the definition of a school bus once years ago. And she found it in the statute somewhere. I know Steve would, Senator Swadisky would be, <laughs> understand the complexities and stuff that go into that. So same with Senator Weger. So those are the, um, Anne, I'm sorry. Well, Anne, I, Anne Marie sounds good. We'll call you Anne. No, you can call her Anne. You were calling her Anne. Oh, I was calling her Anna? Yeah. I thought I'd go. All right, I'm sorry. So I, uh, you know, why don't we do this quick? I'm going to go down the list and just have the senators introduce themselves quick, what district, who they are, what district, and welcome to the committee. We do have one new uh, name and face on here. So we'll start with that. And I'll start with uh, Senator Duckworth. Why don't you give us a quick, um, then it'll be Senator Coleman. Why don't you give us a quick 15-second uh, hello and where you're from and uh, welcome to the community. Sure, I knew you were going to put me on the spot first. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Zach Duckworth. I'm from Senate District 58, which is uh, in the South Metro. Uh, the two largest cities are Lakeville and Farmington. Very much look forward to uh, this meeting today. Thank you. And Zach is a school board member as well down there, correct? Correct. Former chair of the uh, Lakeville School Board. Okay. Uh, Julia. Hi everyone, my name is Julia Coleman. I represent Senate District 47, which is the majority of Carver County. So we're home to great cities like Chanhassen, where I'm a former city council member, Chaska, Victoria, Waconia, and a lot of small rural areas as well as suburban mixed in. So it's a really good blend and I look forward to this hearing today. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Senator Swodinski. Muted there, Mr. Swodinski. Unmute yourself. Sorry, is that part? Is that my time up then? That um, I was muted. Um, hi, I'm Steve Swad Senator Steve Swadzinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, love this committee. It's my fifth year on it, and there's no committee that gives me greater joy and pleasure than um, trying to make the best system, educational system in the country for our um, for our young um, future citizens. So. What, thank you, and welcome to the new members. Thank you, Senator Swinski. Uh Senator Isaacson. Thank you. Uh, sorry for uh, my outdoor setting. I hope you can enjoy a little of the great tundra of Minnesota here. Uh, this is my ninth session uh, in the legislature, my fifth one as a senator, and my third one on E12. I was on E12 at one point in the House. 
or been on higher education. And I'm super excited to be back on E12 again and looking forward to doing some good work for Minnesota. Thank you, Senator Isaacson. Welcome to the committee as well. Senator uh, Weger, then Senator Kunish. Hello, everybody. I'm Chuck Weger. I reside in Maplewood. My district is District 43, which is eight uh, area communities throughout Northeast Metro. I'm in my 25th year in the legislature. I've been on E12 for each of those. Education is my top priority. Look forward to working with everybody. Thank you, Senator Weger. Senator Kunish, I get that right? You're muted. We have the progressive commercial. Um, so nice to meet all of you. I am Senator Mary Kunish. I represent District 41, which is Columbia Heights and Hilltop, <coughs> New Brighton, St. Anthony Village, Fridley, and a little bit of Spring Lake Park. Mm -hmm. I uh, have just spent the last four years over in the house and all of those years I've been on uh, education committees. This past uh, session, I was the vice chair for education policy, which uh, makes sense because I am, am an educator of 25 years. I just retired in November um, after my 25th year uh, and 20 of those years, I was a library media specialist. So the uh, situation that we have at hand is really near and dear to me as well as um, you know, building on the, the past uh, of my experiences and just really pleased and proud to sit on this committee with all of you. Thank you. Welcome, Senator Kunish. Thank you. Kunish, I'm sorry. Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, my name is Scott Newman. I am a senator from Senator Senate District 18 uh, that uh, encompasses uh, all of three counties about 60 miles west of the Twin Cities. My hometown is Hutchinson. Uh, I've been in the Senate now uh, for eight years. I am the neophyte on the uh, committee. Uh, this will, have, will be my first year in education, although uh, I did serve uh, in the House on the Education Committee uh, a number of years ago. Uh, but uh, so, so I have a little bit of an idea, although my information is probably out of date. So I'll be uh, doing my best to listen. Uh, but I'm very happy to be on the committee. I think we've got uh, a lot of really important issues that we have to address. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Newman. Senator Eichhorn, last but not least, of course. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. I'm Senator Justin Eichhorn. I'm from Grand Rapids. Of Grand Rapids, Bemidji, Walker in my district. I task a cast in Beltrami counties. This will be my fifth year on education, uh, second term. So I'm excited to serve with you as a new chair. Uh, Senator Chamberlain, I'm looking forward to the challenges we have and, and your direction on the committee. So looking forward to serve with everybody and looking forward to hear what everybody has to say so we can uh, serve kids because that's what we're here for. So I'm excited for it. Thanks. Thanks, Senator Icorn. Well, thanks again for everybody uh, for the intros. Look forward to it. Thank you for wanting to be on the committee. Sometimes this is right up there with HHS, but uh, it's an important committee. I'm uh, honored and happy and proud to have the ability to do this. I have been on K-12 for 10 years since I started. Some years uh, very challenging, every year challenging and interesting. And Ms. Butler, Ms. Lewis has been there the whole time. Uh, and uh, Betsy and Jenna are fairly new. So I look forward to this and we'll certainly have difficult conversations in the future, but it's an important committee, much to be done and to discuss as we go forward. So thank you all again. With that, we'll get started. Now, uh, <coughs> if we're in a committee room, which we will hopefully be soon, it's partially, we can't be there for a variety of reasons, technology, COVID issues, but we will eventually be there in a few weeks and we'll be able to manage this effectively. But it's important to have people and faces in a room so we can work together and build those relationships. And um, it's important to see faces. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, so we do this with this, uh, some of you have been through this, uh, but we have an agenda. We, uh, we're gonna stick to those topics. Each person has about, has no more than five minutes just because I want, we want to maximize this. Uh, I would ask that you, we keep this civil and above board uh, because, <laughs> 
Um, it can easily go sideways in these environments, but we'll try to stay civil on topic and we'll get through this just fine. So what I'll do is I'll mention who's up first. I should have mentioned uh, coffee, you'll be up first. <laughs> I know you wanted that. <laughs> so coffee will be up first and then uh, Mr. Christensen, is it Chick, Paul Chick? And then Peltier. So first is uh, coffee and Mr. Christensen and then Mr. Chick. I just have first initials here, so I don't know who that might be. So with that, why don't we, uh, we're a little bit of, we're two minutes ahead. That's great so far. So why don't we uh, go ahead and uh, Ms. Uh, Coffee, why don't you start, uh, introduce yourself for the record and uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Um, my name is Coffee, and I live in Shoreview with my husband and my three kids who are um, 12, 14, and 16. Um, as far as my COVID experience has been, it's been a little difficult. My 16-year-old um, my has a disability. So although he's 16, it's like he's three. He wears diapers. He speaks in short sentences. Um, so distance learning just over a computer didn't work for him. I'd have to follow him around with an iPad. I work full-time, granted. I don't have time for this. Like, I can't follow him around with the iPad and even then have him chuck it down the stairs or try to move it to something more interesting like Barney. And so um, it was really difficult trying to have him in distance learning. And he's been basically had no de um, education from March until about November. Um, they did have school for a little bit, but then due to the governor's order, we couldn't have school. So it was very, a very short time that we had school. Um, so but anyways, um, I have a group of parents who of special needs kids, and we've been doing lots of research and we're on top of all the newest developments. And the Department of Ed has allowed for community providers to come into homes to educate kids. And so it's the choice of the school. And I think it's only for disabled kids, but I was able to persuade my kid's school to give him a community provider. So now he is a paraprofessional that comes into our home and teaches him eight hours a week and it is amazing and she does such a great job and so I feel like he's getting some education but life just sucks it's really hard trying to do it all like there I've never taken Dave's off just using vacation just to sit at home and get things done but sometimes I feel like I'm drowning sometimes I cry you know and so I find myself having to do that more often I just feel really bad for people who are single parents because I don't know how how they do it my other kids are struggling too more socially they never leave the house they seem to have more social anxieties in my opinion. And if we could do private school for them, we would. The reason I feel so, so strongly about education is because I grew up with a mom on drugs. We had times of, you know, extreme poverty. I remember being in the store when there were price tags and she'd switch the price tags to something cheaper so she could afford the food that we bought. So we weren't, you know, I grew up with a lot of um, dysfunction. My dad took us, he married a woman her stepbrother sexually abused me for like six or seven years lots of dysfunction in my life growing up but I knew that if I could get an education I could get out and that I could escape that and so I just feel very 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 strongly um about education and I think the solution to all of this right now would be for the money to follow the student so whatever government money is allotted per student should be able to go to the student to be used should be allocated to get the student educated if distance learning won't work for them um, but I know that there's a lot of people out there, mainly the teachers union, and then there's others too, who do not want there to be as much school choice. They don't want the money allocated to the students and they want it, everyone to just stay in public school, even if it isn't, um, isn't even working for them. So when I was asked to speak today, the first thing I thought of was this article I read in the Minnesota Post from August titled, Stay in Public Schools, the Anti-Racism We Need from White Families During the pandemic. I find the title absolutely troubling and many things in the article troubling, but for the sake of time, what stuck out for me most was there's a quote and it talks about when urban districts choose distance learning, they are valuing the lives of children of color, black children and indigenous children um, because of their increased risk of COVID-19. And it just bothered me so bad. I looked on the Department of Health's website, 7% of Black kids, there's 7% of Minnesota's black people, only 9% have, are, have COVID. But yet I looked at the reading and writing proficiencies 
and math. And for reading, white kids are at 66%, black kids at 34%. That's for the whole state of Minnesota. For math, 60, 63% for white kids and 26% for black kids. And then this article went on to talk about how we need to keep, you know, white parents, please don't take your kids out of the urban public schools because we need to fund fund equity programs and equity positions and our kids need to learn about anti-racism and because these our public schools really value the lives of black kids and kids of color and i think if we value their lives then we will teach them to read and write and if we value equity we will teach them to read and write because that is the only way that's the only way to really get equity versus just talking about it it's actually giving people skills they need to escape poverty um and so i just yeah, so it really bothers me that the people who speak the loudest about um, caring about the most marginalized in society are the ones yelling the loudest about keeping it at keeping distance learning going, even though it's not working for most people. So um, just please remember that education is the great equalizer, like it was for me, I, from my personal experience. And I'm asking that you guys do something to allow the money to follow the kids, like it was for my kid, Caleb, even though that program is just for kids with disabilities and it's not required for kids. I think something like that should be enacted for more students. And that in general, if parents want to choose private school or any other option like tutoring right now, that that needs to happen immediately because the kids who are the most marginalized are falling further and further behind. And I thank you for allowing me to speak. I think listening to parents is a great start and I really appreciate it. And I'm willing to help you guys with whatever you need help with. I have other groups out there working on education right now that I'm a part of and I would be happy to help you in any way I can. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mitt. I want to make sure I get the, I, I've had trouble with this Monska. Yep, thank copy, you. yep. Thank you very much for, for the insight and the thoughts and some of the things that the department is trying to do to, to help mitigate it, but uh, need more. So thank you very much. Um, so next up was Mr. Christensen, and then after Mr. Christensen, um, we have Paul Chick. Okay. Well, Mr. Christensen, you're up. All right. Thank you. Hello, members of the Senate. Hello, members of the Senate Education Committee. Uh, my name is Kyle Christensen. I have children in fourth, sixth, and eighth grades in Farmington Public Schools. That's uh, Independent School District Number 192. Um, we know COVID-19 is real. Uh, for some, it poses considerable risks of complications, and for a few, it can be worse. But one of the real challenges in this crisis has been understanding and balancing the actual risks to most people with the costs and the trade-offs of our public policy response. Um, early on, we didn't know a lot about COVID-19 and without data or context, uh, imaginations ran wild. Uh, today, we know that COVID-19 is not the indiscriminate killer once feared. We also know that aggressive measures such as closing schools and businesses are causing very real harm to children, families, and our communities. Although we understood the need to do so, to prepare our health system at the time, we were all saddened when the state ordered schools closed last March. Uh, that sadness turned into grief for students, teachers, and parents when we all realized there would be no return to classes last spring. Uh, the Safe Learning Plan should have paved a way to the return to classes in the fall. Instead, uh, it introduced arbitrary metrics that created a whole new level of barriers to quality education in public schools. And as a result, even now, we're uncertain when most kids will ever return to school full time. In Farmington, our schools began this fall under the hybrid learning model. Our kids were at school, our kids were at school Mondays and Tuesdays and did, did distance learning on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Fridays were catch up days for students and teachers. Then uh, in November, like most uh, districts, when cases started to surge, uh, we went to full-time distance learning. My sense is that Farmington schools were better positioned for this and these different learning models than many other districts across the state. Every student, in Farmington has had an iPad for many years. In fact, I don't remember the last time we really ever had a snow day. Um, our teachers are, are pretty good at adapting and, and, and working with the technology. And this is okay for the short term, but it's really unworkable over the long haul. Our kids, my kids and their peers in public schools are struggling. My daughter, Ella, is in fourth grade. She misses her teachers and her classmates, um, but more than that. And she loves her teacher, but each day, Every seem, seems much more like an exercise in checking off the boxes than it does really like a true learning experience. Joshua is my eighth grader. He spends each day shifting between technology platforms like Schoology, Notability, Google Meets, and others which make up a complicated web of tools uh, for viewing videos, downloading assignments, attending meets, and submitting his work. 
Uh, he struggles to keep up with deadlines and inevitably the details that get lost in the shuffle of all of that. Um, like many others, his, his grades have fallen. But it's Evan, my sixth grader, who we really worry about the most. He's our child diagnosed with ADHD. He's got an IEP for academic and emotional uh, uh, social development support. In distance learning, he's just detached from school. He needs interaction with teachers. And absent that, he just doesn't connect with the coursework. He's surrounded by distractions, including the videos and games that are really just a click away. The, the upside of technology, it provides a lot of flexibility. The downside of technology is it comes with distractions. Um, his teachers and support staff are doing their level best. But the Safe Learning Plan has erected barriers even for kids like him to get the in-person support they need. He's falling behind academically and socially, and it's not easy seeing my son, who used to love going to school, kind of dread waking up each day because he just doesn't see the point. The worst of all of this for us and for most parents that I speak to is the tears of frustration and the evening spent arguing about missed meetings, late assignments, and falling grades. We all understand the need for sacrifice, but a lot of us are just done pretending that this is okay. This can't become a precedent. This isn't just about our students, though. I believe state policy is failing our public school teachers, too. I see their heroic efforts to hold together an unworkable system just enough to get by. I see their late night emails. I hear the exhaustion in their voices through virtual meetings with my kids. I'm also where many of the tears shed come from the educators when distance learning transitions are announced because they know better than any of us that detachment and isolation is not good for their students. State officials uh, to date would like us to believe that only good has come from stay at home orders and safe learning plans. The truth, that, the truth is those are destructive policies too. It's reported widely that our kids are failing academically with racial and socioeconomic gaps widening and growing deeper. Our kids' mental health is faltering. According to the CDC, the proportion of mental health related ER visits for children aged five to 11, 12 to 17 years increased approximately 24% and 31% respectively. Last month, the Minnesota Department of Health also reported that drug overdose deaths among young people increased 31% in the first half of the year of last year. I've spoken to pediatric nurses alarmed by the rapid increase in patients admitted to their care for self-harm and attempted suicide. Today, I'm grateful this community is listening. Until now, concerns like ours have been unwelcome in St. Paul. Here, concerns for job and economic security are greedy. Those who fear for their health and safety of their children are selfish. And any other dissent gets dismissed as inconsiderate of the greater good. I question what greater good they're talking about. Our leaders put great faith in data and science, and that's great. But the data and science say that K through 12 schools are safe. The experts say denying our children access to in-person learning is detrimental to their health and the health of their communities. It's, it's in the interest of the greater good to restore in-person classroom-based instruction in Minnesota schools. So thank you for your time this afternoon. I hope our testimonies help inform better, uh, more sensible uh, and balanced policies that restore high standards for learning in our state going forward. Thank you, Mr. Christensen. Um, members, I just should uh, also re remind you, I didn't do this initially. Uh, there, I think you should have received also uh, a written testimony via uh, email. The members. the members did. The members uh, on the committee should have received the written testimony that was submitted by a variety of people, including teachers and, and others. So that's available too. I did read through most of those. Secondly, um, we will have MDE and Commissioner uh, or Adosh here next Wednesday. They couldn't make it in Monday. So they'll be here next Wednesday to uh, talk about a few budget issues, plus um, also their school opening plan. So just as a heads up, we'll hear from them next Wednesday. They just couldn't get here on, on Monday. So next up is, thank you members. So after Mr. Uh, Mr. Chick goes, we'll open it up to members for a couple of questions if you have some. So Mr. Chick, you're up and then uh, Mrs. Ms. Beltier, you're on deck, okay? Okay, Mr. Chick, go ahead. Go All right, ahead. thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Chamberlain and members of the Senate D12 Committee. Uh, my name is Paul Chick. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, you're listening to testimonies about COVID school issues or school closures have meant to families. I represent several families and in indirectly a small town in Southwest Minnesota, right on the South Dakota border. I am the superintendent principal of Hendricks Public School and in Hendricks, Minnesota. I'd like to present three issues that our district is facing at this time during the pandemic. Our school has been open and in person since August 17th. 
My school has 132 pre-K through 12 students. We're very small. We have 37 students in 7 through 12. 10 of those students currently play basketball and or gymnastics. Since our district is so small, we look for creative ways to provide uh, uh, unique opportunities for our students. One of those unique opportunities that we have is that we compete in South Dakota in, in a sports cooperative with Esteline, South Dakota. Um, you may or may not know, South Dakota sports have not been affected by the pandemic like they have in Minnesota. Our 10 students have not been allowed to participate in with, with their South Dakota teammates since November 9th, the beginning of our gymnastic seasons. Those seasons have been ongoing in South Dakota. The first issue I want to bring to point is uh, declining enrollment. Around that time in mid-November, my school was informed that two families, five students, would be transferring out of our school district to go to South Dakota schools. Following the December 16th announcement of the Executive Order 2103, which extended the sports restriction from December 18th to January 4th, two students came to my office to inform me that they were going to leave our district and go to South Dakota, and one additional student quietly transferred and will start uh, and has started in South Dakota as of January 4th. Fortunately, those two upset students that decided against transferring due to eligibility, but as of January 4th, two days ago, we are down a total of six students, which doesn't seem like a lot of students, but for before break, we had 132 students total. Now we're down to 126. That's almost 5%. The second issue is open enrollment. Something completely ignored by the executive order 2099 and 2103 is the issue of open enrolled students that already leave our community to go to South Dakota as open enrolled students. Within our district, more than 30 students open enroll um, uh, over across the border to South Dakota. With the, ex the executive order doesn't restrict them from freely crossing the state border, attend a school with significantly less restrictions, play sports freely, and return at the end of the day to our community. The 10 students that are part of our cooperative agreement that we send to Esteline should be practicing and playing just as these open enrolled students would do so under the current Minnesota restrictions as part of our agreement with Esteline. When talking with school community and parents, it's hard to explain how denying our 10 students from crossing the border to practice and play sports safely under our Minnesota guidance versus allowing open enrolled students to freely continue makes, um, makes no sense. It seems unfair, it seems inequitable, and it's a huge safety concern for our school and our community. The third issue is loss of autonomy. Because our school is so small, our proximity to South Dakota and the fact that there's no restrictions on open enrollment, the restrictions that our students and their families have willingly endured may be detrimental to our future. We have always been able to find creative ways to provide opportunities for our students and our parents truly appreciate that. But losing our decision-making autonomy during this pandemic could jeopardize our school's future. I very much appreciate the autonomy that we've been allowed to decide to keep our doors open to in-person learning. And we're one of only 49 students currently do, or 49 schools that currently do that. And we've successfully been able to keep our students and staff safe. We know what is best for our students. We've been operating with the best of intentions to provide opportunity for our students while ensuring that our students are safe. Applying restrictions that every school must follow strips our district of its autonomy to do what is best for our students. I thank you, Chair, uh, Chair Chamberlain and the committee members for the work that you do. Thank you again for this opportunity to share. Thank you, Mr. Chick. Uh, appreciate the testimony. Um, did very well. You came in with 30 seconds left. Good. Good. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so members at this point, do you, um, uh, three testifiers been up. Members, do you have any questions uh, so far? We got a few minutes. If you have a question or two, I suppose you can raise your hand and Judy or Greg, Judy will look for that. Looks clear. Okay, you have none. Oh, um, Steve, yes, yeah. yes, raise your hand on Zoom, Steve, but that's fine. Yeah, I was trying to find that switch. I <laughs> you can just wave, it's easier. <laughs> just go yeah. ahead, yeah, wave into the camera. We'll do it that way, all right? 
I don't really have a question, but I um, I have a comment in it. So um, thank you, the testifiers. I just want to thank um, specifically Mr. Christensen, um, his comment about I'm hearing the, I don't know the word he used, the pain in, in his um, kids' teachers' voices really resonated with me. And um, I just appreciate the acknowledgement of, of not only our children are suffering, but our teachers as well. They want to be in back in the classroom as much as anybody. And yep. But we're dealing with a... It's a pandemic, and um, but we'll hopefully through the testimony, the the rest of the testimony, it'll make us all better senators and um, make your lives a little bit richer as well. So, thank you, Senator Swedinski. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I remember talking just briefly. I talked to a, a couple of superintendents a, a couple of months ago, and uh, it's hard on <laughs> it's hard on them, and and uh, with the shifting regs and policies they're doing the best they can but you're right i agree uh, it's a good point well taken uh so next up uh, if there's nothing else we'll move on so miss peltier and then on deck i did have my oh, oh i'm sorry go ahead chuck go ahead senator weaver yep uh thank you mr chair and to the testifiers and you know, I, I believe this is the first time we've had a hearing in a long time on this subject and that's really important and I look so forward to for some of the very good questions raised to have uh, MDE and other stakeholders where we can collectively brainstorm uh, bipartisan solutions. Uh, for the superintendent, I, I wanted to mention that there is a bipartisan initiative. Uh, Senator Utke and myself uh, put in a bill in the uh, one of the special sessions for addressing revenue lost due to declining enrollment. So just so you're aware of it, we are very aware of the impact it's having on districts. So, you know, that and other proposals will be forthcoming. Uh, and I did want to ask if, if uh, I guess for Mr. Christensen, if there were any recommendations that he would repeal or that he would change at the Department of Education. Uh, I mean, it, because you know, we're looking at protecting students and, and everybody wants students to return to school, especially the teachers and staff, but it's providing protection. And so, uh, and, and as everybody has pointed out, it, it is having an impact, it's disruptive, mm -hmm. it's a night, but we're balancing. But so is there, a, you know, or for any of them, a specific, uh, requirement right now that you would repeal my understanding thank you for the question senator wigger um my understanding is that you know that when i look at the safe learning plan it, there's a lot of um there's a, a great dependence on county level uh case rate information uh in mandating which learning models whether it's hybrid uh in person or distance learning there's um there's very rigid guidelines around that my my observation is that districts are being uh, held to a standard that seems to imply that no risk is is the only risk that's acceptable. Um, so I think that in 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 one way, I think that those those guidelines, and I understand they're developed by the Minnesota Department of Health, and they're all um, you know doing what they think is best. And it was developed at a time when um, not a lot was understand understood about COVID nineteen or the role of schools and children in transmitting the virus. Um, but but I, I in, you ask what things I would. Um, uh, I would look to uh, see changed. One would be really reevaluating whether those very low benchmarks of 10 cases per 10,000 in every county across the state are wise and, and meaningful for uh, providing safety and quality of education in our schools. Um, uh, you know, in terms of getting kids back into full-time uh, in-person learning. Um, the other is, um, you know, we're holding, uh, you know, as as Mr. Chick. Um, noted that many of these requirements are really holding um, uh, school districts to, you know, kind of blanket policies across the state. So I, I think they're, you know, in, in two things, I'd say, look, we need to look at those guidelines. I think um, whether those are the right, uh, I guess, viral um, case rate information for those decisions. But I think more than anything else, we know now that that children in schools don't play a significant uh, role in transmission or community transition. We know that, um, you know, the World Health Organization, the CDC and others say that these, say that schools are um, in, in the American Academy of Pediatrics, all of these organizations acknowledge that that schools are are safe, uh, both for students and for those who work in them. And I 
believe me, I understand that we're talking about the workplace of teachers here. Um, so so I, I appreciate that balance, but I just think that the balance has been too shifted to locking things down and forcing districts into positions that are not necessarily good for the quality of education or for the health of their students to date. Thank you, Mr. Christensen. We're a little bit behind, so we're gonna to try to catch up. Thank you, Senator Weger, for the question. Thank you, Mr. Christensen. Uh, so next up, we have Ms. Beltier, and then on deck, Mr. Turner. And Tonya will be after that. So Ms. Peltier, Mr. Turner, and then Drawn, Tonya. Thank you very much. So Ms. Peltier, go ahead. Bye. All right, I'll try to make up some time. Hello, Mr. Chair Chamberlain and members of the E12 committee. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Tracy Peltier from Hugo, Minnesota. Myself and my husband have three daughters in the White Bear Lake School District. Lily is in sixth grade at Gentry Charter School this year. Abby is in fourth grade and Sophia is in second grade at Onika Elementary. Spring break of 2019 was the beginning of a drastic change to our education of our kids. Jason and I sell real estate with Edina Realty and I also worked part-time at a winery. The shutdown began last spring and I had to step back from my career to be home with the kids. We got through the school year and the summer came. Life seemed normal. Kids were playing softball, hockey was back on, they were water skiing and fishing. Soon that summer came to an end and the new stress of having no idea what the school year was going to be became, came on. We decided on Gentry Charter School for my sixth grader because they actually had a plan. White Bear Lake had no plan as of mid-August. They started two weeks late um, and their plan was then hybrid, two days in person, shortened by one hour, and then two days distant learning. Fridays were off for makeup days. Um, by Thanksgiving break, Hill Murray, the private school near us, has had more in-person education than our students in White Bear Lake will have all year long. There's a huge gap between the people that are available to afford a private school to the ones that are in public school, in my opinion. The back and forth added new stress. Honestly, watching a seven-year-old with a 10-pound backpack was quite comical at very many times. But the constant of bringing supplies back and home, forgetting something this day, computers, it was just complete stress. The first week of school, my seven-year-old was reprimanded at school for trying to give a girl a hug that she hadn't seen all summer long. As she spoke to me that night, tears rolled down her face as she could not understand the social distancing with friends as all summer long they were playing in the neighborhood together. I've purchased math programs, science projects, learning games, but I cannot purchase the social growth that in-person learning gives our kids. Slowly, I've watched my girls' excitement for education fade. I watched my girls who never wanted to be inside, alone, they wanted to always be playing with their friends, had become conditioned to screens and isolation. The great days grew shorter, the darkness creeps in. Not having a career for myself takes a toll on myself. At times, I felt defeated, I felt depressed. The spikes of energy came through volleyball, through hockey. My girls received such joy from being out with their teammates again, seeing their classmates, being in the neighborhood. They hated all the rules, but they were willing to sacrifice it just to be a part of the in-person learning, to be on the team with their kids. In October, the CDC numbers came through and the fatality rate we saw was much lower than what we thought it was going to be last spring. However, COVID cases started to rise. We knew that here in Minnesota, yet studies from Duke University and Brown University showed that kids are not the super spreader that we once thought. However, we were faced with another shutdown to school and hockey. Here in our household, it was complete devastation for my kids. Spiked by the next day of having an increased amount of jealousy because Gentry, where my daughter is, my oldest is at, stayed in a hybrid situation and still playing hockey as my other two sat home completely distant learning. Another spark of light we received over the Christmas break was we get a return to hockey on the 4th. And uh, we are now starting January 19th for second grade and in February for fourth grade, only to face the new regulations with masks of playing hockey and also in gym class. The kids, they'll do anything to be with their friends on the ice to the team. But now as a parent, I have to make that decision at what risk do I have my kids on the ice to play heads down hockey, to breathe in bacteria in a wet mask, to be in gym class all day long. Um, 
it's frustrating, I will say. We hear from the Minnesota Department of Education that they're listening to the Minnesota Department of Health who says they're listening to science. CDC, the WHO, they say you shouldn't wear a mask while vigorously exercising, but yet now pediatrics say you can. So it's very confusing to try to talk to our kids of what science we're listening to. They're on the computers three to five hours a day. They're reading, they hear the news. They have so many questions and they just want to be in school. They want that connection with their friends. Um, and it's, it's heartbreaking to watch as a parent. Um, I've seen firsthand kids in our neighborhood at 11 years old now cutting themselves um, and the stress of those parents. Um, through all of this, I would say in closure, um, what the shutdowns have meant to our family has been a roller coaster of sacrifice, of depression, excitement, tons of family bonding, uh, happiness to letdowns and confusion, disappointment, isolation, and a huge financial sacrifice to our family that no COVID relief plan will ever touch. And through all of this, I honestly feel less impacted than the majority of our friends. Thank you, Ms. Peltier. Appreciate the comments. Um, stick around if you can. Uh, yep. So, Mr. Turner, you're up, and then Tonya, and then Ms. Hodgman. Uh, by the way, Mr. Helmer, you're last up, uh, and then it'll be Dr. Jensen and Dr. De De Delisi. So, Mr. Turner, you, uh, you're you up. Five minutes up. Go on in. Thank you. You're welcome to the committee. Members of the Senate E-12 committee, my name is Rashad Turner. I'm a parent of a middle schooler and also the president and executive director for Minnesota Parent Union. School closures have affected all of our children in all 87 counties of this state. Uh, for my daughter, who has always been an eager learner, uh, this year has been a complete wreck for her, her classmates, as well as her teachers. As a family, we've had to spend a lot of money out of our own pocket pockets to supplement what's supposed to be a free public education. What about the families who don't have those resources to supplement that free public education? As president and executive director for Minnesota Parent Union, our organization has heard the horror stories shared by families going all the way back to the beginning of Governor Walz's stay-at-home orders. Those stories are horrifying and mirror our education gaps, which are criminal. Families calling schools, no answer. They leave a message, no return call. No support, no education. Families in need of internet and technology, only to be left in the cold without any access to a chance at a quality life, because that's exactly what a quality education leads us to. Schools across the state of Minnesota holding families accountable for absences when it was really the Zoom or the Google Meet and a lack of an understanding on how to use those tools that kept our children from being in class. All while Education Minnesota and teachers unions like the St. Paul Federation of Educators are doing everything they can to run from accountability. Cancel the test, keep our schools closed. Those have been their battle cries going back to the beginning. Why don't they want us to know how well our schools are educating our children? Chair Chamberlain, committee members, don't you all believe that as parents, we need to know how well our children are being educated? Another theme that we've heard from parents across the state is that families deserve a refund. Give us our money back and let us choose when, where, and how our children receive a quality education. I mean, how as a state are we spending the same amount of money and then some, millions more, to only get two hours of face time with our teachers? I mean, I'm no mathematician. I went to public schools. But the numbers don't add up, y'all, and it's quite embarrassing for us as a state. I ask this committee and the rest of our legislature to keep this in mind 
as you hear solutions over the course of this session. Keep in mind that our children need to be in school. They want to be in school. Teachers want to be in school. But a return to normal for a lot of our children in Minnesota means they still won't be able to read. Adequate and uniform systems of schools are not enough. It hasn't been enough since 1857. Quality is, education is a must. Failure is not an option. Appreciate the opportunity to be able to address the committee. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Appreciate that. And boy, that was quick. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Isaacs, you want to ask a quick question? You had your hand up, so we'll let you jump in here. Mr. Chair, I can wait till it's appropriate for a kind of a back and forth. It's not a question, it's a comment. So I'm happy to wait till you're done with your testifier so I don't get you off track. All right, okay. I got your name here. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Turner. Uh, uh, next up is Tonya Drawn, and then uh, Ms. Ms. Hodgman, and then uh, Ms. Nixon, you're in the hole, as they say. All right. So, um, Tonya. Here we go. Here we go. Go, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Chairman Chamberlain and E12 committee members. Um, thank you very much for having me um, testify today, just to kind of give you some of my experiences. I am a mother. I am um, a St. Paul resident, born and raised in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, have deep family ties to Minnesota, definitely. Um, I'm a mother of six children and a grandmother of 13 children. Um, and so my experience this year are vast. Um, with my, my own daughter, who is 10 years old, when COVID first hit, um, she goes to a charter school in St. Paul that I feel has really made a difference as far as her um, social and mental capabilities. But she is a little behind because of the academics of the charter school, unfortunately. Um, and so when COVID first hit, definitely we felt that um, her being behind was hit with us even greater with her getting a tremendous amount of work to do that would keep somebody busy for probably 24 hours a day. And the work that she was given was far beyond her capability of doing it. Even as I sat with her to make sure that she understood or could try to understand the work that was needed. Um, this summer she enjoyed just being with family. We're a very close family, a very big family with all the grandkids. But there was a lot of anxiety for my grandchildren and my, ch my child about the start of school, what school would look like. Um, here in St. Paul, our charter school decided to do just distance learning, but I have grandchildren in St. Louis Park that I had a hybrid mod a model who were able to go to school parts of the week and then do distance learning for the other part of the week. I would say those, those children that were able to do the hybrid model have adapted very well um, and are achieving and being at almost grade level. However, the children that are in St. Paul that are doing just distance learning um, have had a different experience. This year, the teacher that we had was very interactive and she has really pushed my daughter to learn. However, my grandchildren are falling farther and farther behind. Teachers having internet issues where they can't even teach and get their computer goes off right in the middle of a lesson to only being on the screen for one hour a day um, to them just saying, hey, as long as they log in, that's the only thing we need for them this year. We don't care what they really comprehend or learn as long as they're there and they participate and we can see them. Have been some of the responses that my children have received when questioning distance learning or wanting to make sure that distance learning would work for them um, and my grandchildren. It's come down to the fact where I am seeking a tutor for my grandchildren and found a friend that would do it for free um, because I find no resources even for tutoring um, within their school or within that system that we can attain without any kind of a fee. So I am now, you know, seeking out tutors to help my grandchildren. Um, so that's the mother and the grandmother in me <laughs> that's working, but I'm also a community organizer. And so when this started back in April of this year, um, I had tons of parents coming to me for help, for many things, for help paying rent because they were falling behind in rent being, being trying to work and trying to do distance learning with no child care, um, to um, basic medicine because their job had stopped and they put the last bit of money on food for their family instead of buying medicine for themselves. Um, I actually started a different group 
with Minnesota Parent Union being one of the collaborators called the Fannie Education Alliance because we were just so sick and tired of being sick and tired of falling behind and nobody listening to us, nobody giving us the resources we needed. From internet to the technology that was needed, it was a complete failure for a lot of families and families were reaching out to schools, to people that were supposed to be navigating for them and not finding the help that they needed and would cling on to us because we were trying to teach them how to advocate for their family's needs and what they needed the most. Um, when Chairman and I were speaking earlier today, he asked me, did parents feel like they were becoming super parents? And I would have to say, yeah, we are. We're super parents at this point. We're teachers, we're facilitators, we're nurses, we're chefs. And then on top of that, we're holding down 20 and 30 hour and 40 hour jobs. Um, daughters, my daughter, my oldest daughter is not an essential worker, but she works at a pawn shop. The pawn shop didn't close because it was a financial means for people to get money during this time. However, she had to cut back her hours to three days a week instead of 40 to 50 hours a week because she had no childcare outside of me and she knew that I was working and everything else. So adding even more children to my home when I'm working um, was something she didn't want to do, but we came to a compromise. I watched her children three days a week. But this is what parents are going through. We really need the help. If you're not going to open up the schools all the way, then making sure that parents have options learning pods out in the community that parents can send their children to that are help pay through the educational system, tutors to make sure that these students that are falling are behind are getting caught up and will understand and be at grade level at some point because we already know the disparities that were there before all this happened have been made even greater now. Um, child care for parents that are really struggling. If you're not going to have my child in that classroom for eight to ten hours a, uh, a day, how am I supposed to go to work for that same time period and still be able to pay my rent and pay for everything else. Um, so there has to be some type of compromise. And we really, really need you guys to listen, to open up your ears, to really think outside of the box, to come up with solutions that work for us. And before you implement those solutions, come back to us and ask us, hey, this is our ideas. Do you think they will work? And let us give us your opinion. Don't just put something in play where we're you know, where we're part of it, and then if we tell you it doesn't work, that that's it, and that's what we're stuck with. We really need you guys to really um, just think about it. Think about the, the, what position we're in. Um, that, you know, it's not going to be a cookie cutter position for everybody to fix this, but there are some options that we can get. There are some monies that we can get that can help us do this and this. And I, I'm very grateful that you're at least giving us this opportunity to talk to you with open ears because um, it's definitely what is needed at this time. And thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Dawn. I really appreciate that. Um, members, we're going to, Senator Jensen was good enough to, you know, offer, offer some uh, help and insight here with a few points. We were going to have him come in last, but he's got a hard four o'clock. So we're going to let Dr. Jensen jump in here. <clears throat> After Dr. Jensen, he'll have about five minutes as well. So then we're going to go Miss Miss Hodgson and then Miss Nixon after that. Hodgson, Nixon after Dr. Jensen. All right. So Dr. Jensen, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and for the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate being in front of you. I'm Dr. Scott Jensen, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share information with your committee. I will proceed. Essentially, the number one cause of school closure is generally weather in this country, and the second is teacher strikes. And so studies have been done during those kinds of time frames. And what studies have shown in terms of the physical aspects of what happens when school closure occurs, particularly to the 10 to 18 year old, schools administer vaccines, these drop off dramatically. And during the pandemic, we've seen that already. For the younger children, eye and ear examinations drop off. And so there's a great fear that we will miss or be delayed in picking up significant hearing and vision loss. Free and reduced priced lunches are a part of how students are physically impacted. And this clearly drops off. And it's very difficult to orchestrate uh, the the necessary steps within a community to get these kids fed the way they have been. Emergency nursing care is interrupted. 
identifying children at risk is a huge issue because it's oftentimes teachers that notice things first. And we're seeing that as well. We're seeing hotlines ring off the charts, if you will. We know that there's an increased risk of accidents, infections, malnutrition, and premature fatalities. If we slide over into the mental health just a little bit, and I'll try to avoid that because I think you have other testifiers speaking to that issue. There's no question that anxiety, depression, suicide, and suicide attempts go up dramatically, and they have. As a single physician speaking to the committee today, I can tell you that I've never seen so many suicides in such a truncated time frame as during this pandemic, in particular during school closures. A journal statement from the pediatrics came out and said that chronic school ab absenteeism, particularly starting in the early grades, puts students at risk for poor performance and ultimate dropout. Lockdowns cause school absenteeism. When you lock down for a while and then come back into play, you don't immediately bounce back to the level of attendance that you had prior to that. So I think that those are the comments I would have in regards to specific physical impacts of school closures. But I also, if I could, I'd like to just take 30 seconds and say that a part of the school experience is extracurriculars. And when it comes to extracurricular activities, this idea that we can have 12 and 14 year old kids trying to perform physically at the maximum of their capability and wear masks is going to cause problems. We will have some form of catastrophe and then we're all gonna shake our head and say, oh, if we only would have known. I, I cannot say strongly enough how wrong I think it is to take a group of people between five and 20 that have virtually no risk of death from this disease. We've never done this with other pandemics. And yet we're telling them, if you're playing hockey, put on a helmet, put in a mouth guard, wear a mask, perform to your maximum physical capability, breathe, spew, spit into your mask until it's wet. We don't even know if it has any mitigating impact at that point in time at all on any viral load that may or may not be present. We know that that young person will be breathing in and out the virus, the bacteria, and even the fungus that normally resides in the maxillary sinuses and the pharyngeal orifices. I'd be glad to stand for any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. Um, uh, thank you very much for that insight. You brought up some things that I had not considered or heard about or thought about. Um, yeah, as long as you got time, we, we got some more testifiers. Uh, I don't know, maybe we should see if there's any for Scott, Senator Jen, uh, Dr. Jensen right now, and then we move on. You got to take off. Does any uh, members, do you have any questions? Yeah. Jensen, Can I ask you a question? Senator Weeger, go ahead. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Jensen uh, noted what you said regarding risk for students. We want students back in school. We're trying to balance the public health interest, which obviously is a debate. You didn't mention any statistics whether staff might be at risk. Uh, could you comment or do you sense that whether public school or any school staff might be at risk? Dr. Jensen? Mr. Chair? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Weger. That's a great question. And I, I would say one thing, I think we definitely need to make certain that everybody understands that teachers and staff are essential. They're essential to the way our country works. In terms of specific statistics and, and uh, if you will, transmission from students to staff, quite honestly, the data has been very difficult to accumulate. And the recent studies that have come out have been, have been really waffling in terms of whether or not asymptomatic students are going to transmit to, to staff and to teachers. The, st the staff and teachers that I've talked with in the office on a, on a daily or weekly basis have indicated that they feel fairly comfortable wearing some sort of a shield. And that's what I usually wear here in the office, uh, because then you don't have any pore size to worry about. You've got a, an absolute blockade. Uh, 
And that seems to be something that's worked quite well. But again, I don't think the data is clear. And, and you're absolutely right, Senator Weger. The staff and, and the teachers uh, do need to be attended to. I think that there's been a little bit of a slow pivot, uh, even there, where the staff and teachers are saying, we need to be in front of our students because this isn't working. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. Uh, Dr. Jensen, I, doc, yes, I, I just want to mention uh, she's not testifying, but there's written testimony from T Tiffany Dietrich from the White Bear Lake Schools, a teacher, and she shares about a staff person who was taking all the directives in terms of wearing masks, et cetera, but still came down with COVID and it's it's been quite a struggle and including visits at Mayo and that so taking all the precautions and still things can happen and again I want to reiterate uh, teachers staff want to be in the classroom but it's weighing that risk and so that was you know, fully knowing what is at stake is you know the heart of what we have to address in looking at uh, how we navigate ahead thank you all right, thank you, uh, Senator Uyghurs. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. We are keep, keep rolling along. So up now is uh, Ms. Hodgman. Did I get that right, Ms. Hodgman? Yes. Um, hello, members of the Senate Education Committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Joanne Hodgman. Um, I'm a member of the Minnesota Parent Union. I am also a social worker. Um, in my community. I am a single parent of three. Um, my children have gone and have gone through um, St. Paul Public Schools and I have two that are still in St. Paul Public Schools. Um, this is what the shutdown has, um, the ways in which it's impacted us. My oldest completed her public education experience without a prom or a typical graduation ceremony. Um, in the spring, my middle child received, in the spring when we first uh, went to distance learning, my middle child who was in middle school um, was receiving tutoring and other supports four to five days a week. Um, now with the, the fall um, distance learning, he has not received any of those supports. Um, so to go from seventh grade receiving lots of supports to eighth grade without receiving any supports. Um, he is supposed to be transitioning to high school uh, next year and he continues to fall further and further behind. Um, due to some of the reasons that have already been mentioned, um, the constant um, uh, switching back and forth between multiple platforms, um, not being able to access uh, teachers when they have questions, um, teachers not responding to emails, um, not knowing how to navigate the, the technology and not, not knowing what they don't know, not, so not knowing what questions they even need to be asking. Um, my youngest uh, is in elementary school. He receives special education services. In the spring, he was attending a school that was not capable of providing the proper level of supports. Uh, he is now attending a school that provides level three special education services, but this means that a nine-year-old must manage his daily work in addition to attending three to five meetings per day, five days a week. Our high, our high speed internet does not always have the bandwidth to handle multiple people, people being on virtual meetings at the same time. Tech was issued to children with all, all of the necessary items, including chargers, styluses, et cetera. Restrictions on district issued equipment prevent students from participating in other beneficial online activities while at the same time not providing enough restriction on their online activity. This leads to the need for almost constant monitoring of iPad usage. This is not a realistic demand for many families. Prior to the pandemic, I had three jobs. I'm a single mom too. Um, I've been unable to work since about three weeks into the pandemic. Um, and I now work primarily from home, but still need to attend some things in person. Um, not being home allows for two of my children that are not in college um, to be on the internet with very little restrictions for them. And then when I'm not here, they don't attend the meetings um, and therefore fall further and further behind um, in their schoolwork. 
Um, one of the things that I think is really important to mention is that St. Paul Public Schools was on strike for a solid week before they shut down for COVID. Um, that had a negative impact on my students. Um, in addition to um, the strike, the pandemic shutdown, and the murder of George Floyd that had a, a very significant impact on our communities. Um, the, the tone deafness, deafness of some of the um, educators in relating to what my children were experiencing and other children I'm sure within the district, but I can only speak for mine, um, about their experiences, what they were feeling emotionally, what they were seeing going on um, in their own communities. We had um, military vehicles parked in front of our house. Um, my son, my youngest, was, was being reprimanded for drawing pictures of himself with a mask on because the teacher said that it was scary for the other children <laughs> for pictures to be posted like that. Um, so there's, there's tone deafness uh, amongst staff. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, there's a distinct difference between distance learning that occurred in the spring and distance learning that is occurring now. And they both had good and bad, um, but we just need to do a better job of ensuring that our children have the technology that they need if we're going to continue with distance learning. Otherwise, finding a safe option for them or safe pathway for them to get back to schools in person safely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Hodgman. Um, um, next up is uh, Ms. Nixon, and then on deck, uh, Ms. Saucer, and finally, Mr. Helmer, and then after Mr. Helmer, we'll have Dr. DeLisi up. So, Ms. Nixon, you're up, Ms. Hauser and Helmer. Hello, and thank you, Mr. Chair, and members of the uh, Senate Education well, I should, Committee. I should, I should get used to the fact I have to say, well, committee, please state your name for the record. I have a little note. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Right my, name is, my name is Sherry Nixon, and I am a uh, parent delegate with the Minnesota Parent Union. I also have children uh, in District 622, uh, which is in Maplewood. My children are eight and 12. So I have a grade school child as well as a middle school child. Um, the shutdown of in-person school has been very life altering as many have stated for them as well, um, as well as for our family. Uh, my son, um, he has a very huge dilemma um, when schools are planning to, know, to open back up. Um, at this point, he's not ready to go back, unfortunately. Uh, right before the shutdown, I would say about a week before the shutdown, he was sick for about two and a half weeks. It was horrible. Um, he was never diagnosed with COVID because I don't believe he was tested for it, but he may have come pretty close to it. Um, he had various symptoms of it. However, he is not in a position to go back. But my daughter, um, who is a middle school uh, child, she is definitely ready to get back into the social light and, you know, be sociable with her friends. Um, now, like many, we have struggled to adapt with distant learning. Um, I have put, as well as my, my partner, we've put in 120% um, into this uh, for the best possible outcome um, for them both, wearing many, many hats, um, teacher, hall monitor, um, doctor, therapist, you name it, we're doing it right now. Uh, nonetheless, we're still working diligently to assure that our children do not lose the big picture. Uh, that focus is receiving a quality um, education, regardless uh, to the uh, learning process. Um, now, I have a few concerns or a couple, I, I should say a couple concerns uh, with that process, uh, which is communication. Uh, the communication for myself um, with teachers um, have been a little laxed or, or relaxed, I should say. Um, and. And, and versus the first time distant learning happened versus uh, improvement, I have seen it, um, but I've also seen, you know, more lacking of uh, communication. Um, we need 
to know where our kids are or where we stand academically, um, not only when it comes to conferences, which we've only had one, uh, but during the interim, you know, if my children are not uh, completing, you know, their assignments or they're not, if, if, if my daughter, um, per se, uh, she's a honor roll student, if you know this to be the case and her, her grades are dropping dramatically, I think like any parent, I would expect a phone call of some nature to speak to this, but when there's not a phone call to this and it goes on and you don't find out about this until conferences, I, I find a very, I, fi I find a disconnect there. I find a huge disconnect there. Now for my youngest son, it's a little different. You know, you just gotta keep them focused and keep them going. Now, rolling into that, I, I'm thinking of standardized testing. I mean, we haven't had standardized testing and with the, the last year, we did we have not had it. Um, to me, as a black parent, you know, of children um, working very hard every day to secure educational excellence for them and their peers. I mean, we need to definitely work on this. We need to measure what's working and what's not. Um, everyone has different stories. They're valued stories. Um, we're all surviving. And I think without testing, um, it's, it's, it's a very bad ordeal. Um, the longer we go without data, the more in the dark we'll be about whether our children are actually learning. Um, I understand how complicated this moment in education is right now. It's 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 we're in a pandemic. I totally get it. But regardless to whether that what that learning process is, we still need to understand um, every experience that our child is having right now. Um, they're not the same, but we need to understand it. So moving forward, um, what the expectations will be. Um, but I'm looking for the school districts to very simply guide us, let us know, show us the way, but also not leave our child behind and struggling and coming into school for the next semester. I don't want to know how far behind they are. We need to know what it is today, what's happening now, because they deserve that quality of education, whether they're in school or distant learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Nixon. Um, the data piece, uh, good points. Okay, thank you again. Ms. Saucer, you're up, and then finally, Mr. Helmer, and then after that, Dr. DeLisi. So I'll restart the clock, and you're up. Thank you. Welcome, right. Katie. Please state your name for the record. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Chamberlain, Senate Committee, Committee Education members, staff, and the state of Minnesota. My name is Melissa Saucer. I serve as the Farmington School Board Chair, and I've served on the board for over 10 years. I also serve with the Intermediate 917 School Board, and I'm a former member of the School Boards Association of the State Executive Member. Today, I'm speaking on behalf of my family and with my own experiences as a board member and not on behalf of the boards I've on or been a part of. First, I want to tell a story about my daughter. She's a fourth grader. She's a self-determined self-starter who loves school. She's done her best with the restrictions, but she spends most days in her rooms working on schoolwork. Yesterday, she wasn't done with work till about 5.30 with brief breaks for lunch. She is sensitive and irritable, and at times I've been doing her chores for her because I can't dare ask her to do something else during her day. Today, she texted me that she was thrilled during her classroom instruction when she found out that she's gonna be able to go back to school full-time in February. I sincerely hope that the experiences shared here of my daughter and all the other elementary learners will be just history and not something they'll be forced to return back to. Allowing the elementary school learning model to be not linked with the county case numbers is a step in the right direction and one I hope to see soon for the secondary learning model. Then there's the story of my son. My son is 13, he's an eighth grader. He is highly functioning autistic, has severe ADHD, anxiety, and nonverbal learning disorder. He has served through a center-based education program within our intermediate 917 schools at our middle school in Farmington. For a brief introduction, the ISD 917 serves our most vulnerable students. The district has a deaf and hard of hearing school, mental health and behavioral programs, just to highlight a few. This last fall until Thanksgiving break, we were thrilled that he was able to attend school four days a week and even jazz band on Friday mornings. Yet after Thanksgiving, it was heartbreaking to learn he would be back to full-time distant learning. A window into his day, he has many meets with his classroom teachers and constant meetings with his para, 
parents and teachers for help all day long. Many times I'll come into room and is pacing and pacing and pacing in his floor and taking more breaks and more snacks because he needs so many time in his day. One day I heard him yelling, yelling in his room. And I went to find out that he was taking a pretest on Khan Academy, a math learning program. And he was yelling that the Khan Academy was coded wrong. He was just so frustrated. It couldn't be his fault. It was the coding of the program. There's many attempts to get him back to school since distant learning, but it's just been a couple hours here and there. As a family, we realized that it would be too much more of a disruption to the routine and schedule he already has than just figure out how that would work. We've seen a regression of skills, loss of services, many skills that I'm fearful in time that will never be made up for his life because it's important right now. His IEP team is made up of many more than just teachers, but therapists and other therapists that help out that we haven't been able to have as much access to with the distant learning environment. Distance learning at best has attempted to meet the needs of those special needs learners at a bare minimum. And in many cases, I would argue that it's failing them and not meeting free and appropriate publication education. Best practice for special needs students is best practice for all. Students need routine, structure, and consistency in relationships with their teachers. What hasn't locked, lacked is caring and heart and help of all those on his team, and I know the teams of many teachers and staff across the state. Yet you can only go so far with limited to no face-to-face -face contact and varied online instruction and continued just changes. From my perspective as a board member and the perspective of the district that I can see in Farmington, district and school board members care and they want to do what is best to, and we will try to work and follow the guidelines that is given from the state. Our administrative teams have worked overtime this year and after each announcement, update and change, I'm in fact proud to say that we've had no community spread of COVID within our district. However, it's been difficult. The difficulty has been timing, lack of immediate details, and quite frankly, lack of any decision-making authority at the local level for the needs of our community. The most recent December 17th order to unlink elementary education from county case data with no specific details from MDE and MDH until the 21st of December, and then again more details changed on the 24th of December. Best case scenario, districts would like the process to be collaborated with them before an official announcement and update to current guidelines are made. Minimally, if an executive decision needs to be made without sufficient time for the previous mentioned collaboration, would ask that all of the requirements be given as the announcement is made. This would allow each district the ability to best formulate how the update will affect them, and most importantly, be able to communicate this with their communities and let families plan. The lack of consistency and rationale amongst restrictions has also been troublesome to understand and quite frankly be able to communicate to our families as well. For example, the Minnesota High School League sports resumed yesterday but with secondary education still trying to county COVID case rate numbers. We have students that are going to sports but they can't go to face-to-face -face learning in our district. The bottom line, it is all about the kids. That's why I'm here, that's why I serve on the school board and that's why I'm here today. We need to come together to meet the needs of all of our students. I shudder to think of the damage this past year has done with Minnesota's already devastating achievement gap. I wanna to close to implore our governor, our health commissioner and our education commissioner to let our students come back to school full time, let our teachers educate them and let our school boards make the decisions for their community. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Slosser. Thank you very much. Um, we have two left. Mr. Helmer, you're up. Last but not least, thank you for your patience. And then Dr. Lisi, and thank you for your patience as well. Looks like a beer saucer is drinking there. <laughs> that is the benefit of not being in a committee room, I guess. Um, okay, uh, uh, Mr. Helmers, Helmers, is it Helmers or Helmer? Helmers. With an S, okay. You're up, uh, we'll start the clock. Go ahead, sir. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Uh, my name is Thaddeus Helmers. Hello, Chair Chamberlain and members of the committee. I have uh, children in ninth and 12th grades in Frazee Burger Independent School District 23. I'm also the school board chair for that uh, district. And I'm also a spokesperson for the Let Them Learn Minnesota group. Um, I understand the impacts that COVID's had on many people across the state and our nation. I have witnessed firsthand when my stepfather passed away just before Thanksgiving due to COVID. But I believe we're at that point where we need to decide do the benefits outweigh the risks. As a parent, I've watched uh, the changes in my boys 
They started the year of 2020 off with a, a sense of loss when their 18 year old brother died of brain cancer on January 9th. Last March, well, last March when schools closed, uh, my boys were devastated. Uh, they instantly missed their friends. They missed the interaction with teachers at school and were nervous about what would happen to their track season. As time progressed, they watched their favorite activities slowly fade away. They watched their friends fade into the background. Uh, and they felt their connection with their older brother through sports diminish and then disappear. Uh, this is when depression started to take hold. Uh, living in Lakes Country, we've got a lot of outdoor space here. They stayed optimistic. They went out to the lake and uh, tried to do what the best they could do with what was going on. As the school year approached, they were anxious, very anxious, um, and excited to go back to school and play sports. Um, our school opened in the hybrid model, and uh, they were very disappointed. Uh, the sports were shut down. My senior was very emotionally hurt when football was not to start, as his older brother played football, and that was uh, him continuing uh, that legacy. He was ecstatic when football came back, and then at the final game, he shed many tears for his brother. As for my ninth grader, uh, he started to distance himself from others, his family, even me. Um, with this deep withdrawal occurred, uh, the deeper withdrawal occurred when the high school went distance learning uh, in November. This is when I saw more drastic changes in my youngest. Um, with sports and certain physical contact with his friends and no aspirations for educational success, uh, he continued to sink. Um, when I told him basketball was an offense, he started to cry because that was his link to his oldest brother is that one of those activities that he shared with them. And that's what kind of kept him motivated, optimistic, determined, and happy. Luckily, two days ago, he was able to start basketball and I saw that spark back into him and it's a, a profound feeling. As for the education being received, there are actually getting good grades, but I don't know if that's indicative of the level of competency that, ex that is expected in the distance learning model of our education system right now. I, I don't know. Um, through all this, my boys have lost motivation, missed out on memories that will never be had. Um, they've lost faith in, our faith in our education system, and the connections between their friends and their uh, teachers is, is no longer there, is as strong as it should be. They've grown anger and resentment. As a combat veteran, I know what it's like to miss out on memories, important events in life, and lose connections between myself and the others I care most about. But honestly, we're not fighting a war here. Um, yet we're isolating these children needlessly as if they've done something wrong. As a school board chair, uh, this has been a challenging year to say the least. Uh, with receiving the learning plans late in the summer, limited funding resources, uncertainty with the COVID funds and how far they did not go, uh, the unanticipated changes that we experienced, the setbacks and the limited time to react, uh, we have been fighting an uphill battle since we opened our doors. Uh, with challenges every turn, it is as if these plans are designed to fail from the beginning. Uh, we are struggling to keep our classrooms moving. Um, my elementary school is still in person today. I, I know Mr. Chick talked about that, um, and I'm very thankful for my teachers that are doing that, but they are struggling to keep it going. We have limited substitutes. These quarantine guidelines are inhibiting us greatly. And of course, I believe that there's no merit nor they're based on facts. If funding models are not adjusted this year or next year, we're gonna witness some serious impacts on being able to keep our teachers. And if we see the influx of students come back after they've gone to a homeschooling, we're gonna see larger and increased uh, class sizes as a cost of that. I know my teachers and administrators is, and I assume many others across the state have been working tirelessly to keep districts moving as best as they can, but they're breaking and we need changes now. Uh, the equity, in, in learning, uh, at least from my perspective, it seems to be it's gone to the wayside at this point and it's everyone for themselves and who has the most money is able to get the education and those that don't, uh, they're set to struggle and uh, try to survive. And it, getting back to any type of state standard across the board is gonna be a daunting task because I've talked to many teachers, especially in the elementary school where their grade spans in math or reading are you know, three grade levels within one grade. and I. I hope we get some plans soon to try to get that back to a good standard. As a board member, I also have a commitment to my constituents. I've spent many hours listening, talking, reading, composing emails, trying to comfort not just you know teachers, parents, admin, you name it, in the, with confidence that we're trying to do what's right and what we're doing. 
As a spokesperson for Let Learn Minnesota, Minnesota, I speak for over 6,000 parents from all corners of the state. It's comprised of teachers, healthcare professionals, social workers, you name it, someone in our group does it. I've corresponded with hundreds of parents, teachers, a lot of people within our group, um, several uh, state house reps and a couple of state senates with you guys. Um, they all want their students back in school. Um, and it's not just about the education. Our youth have been stripped of what they need, what they desire, what they yearn for. And many feel as if they don't matter. They are social beings as many of us are, and they need that interaction beyond the sight and the sound. They need that human physical contact and the smells of that comfort when they go into that school. They have lost life lessons. They've been denied opportunities. I know what does not kill us makes us stronger, but at what point do we control the needless damage being done to our youth and get back to developing them for the better in the future? I ask those listening here and online to reflect on our times in school and what impacts our friends, teachers, counselors, coaches had on our development, because I know from my background, they had an increase, intense impact on how I develop and how I continue. We need those connections back and those students to those connections. Mr. Helmers, we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, okay. Closing statement or comment. I've learned a lot today listening to those speaking, and, and I'll have many more questions, more visions of how to go forward. I appreciate this opportunity to speak, and I am here to uh, this committee to help in any capacity needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Helmers. Um, so members, uh, everybody, we're going to have Dr. DeLisi make some comments, and then um, uh, Senator Isaacson had a couple comments, I believe, for a question. Dr. DeLisi, welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record, and thank you for your patience. You're very welcome. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee for the invitation to testify. I'm Dr. Steve DeLisi, and I'm with the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation. We have heard already just what kind of impact that COVID-19 pandemic has had on our youth and our families. I'm here to talk about how we need to look to support families, schools, and our students so that we do not see the ramifications stretch beyond the years from this pandemic. We are already seeing the impact that it's having on the youth of our nation and here in Minnesota. The additional social issues that we are seeing today and the racial inequities are also contributing to increases in substance use, depression, anxiety, and other significant mental if, uh, health issues in our children. A study just published in the last month has stated that the deaths of despair for our teens, deaths of despair are deaths of suicide, drug overdose, and alcohol-related deaths quadrupled in the past decade, and that was before the COVID pandemic. This is a time of crisis and needs our action. Many times, middle school and high school students feel the biggest impact. This is a critical time of development for the students and the social isolation, social unrest, and the uncertainties that our families are experiencing are contributing to the increased mental health issues that we are seeing. This is truly a national adverse childhood experience happening across the country. Hazel and Betty Ford is the largest organization, nonprofit organization for prevention, early intervention, treatment, and recovery services for those struggling with addiction and co-occurring disorders. And we have seen across our, our system of care, we have absolutely seen increased mental health needs from the patients who are coming, both adult and our adolescents. We need action now. As this committee considers how best to impact and truly change the trajectory of what can become lifelong and chronic substance use and mental health disorders, I urge you to look at the ways in which that trajectory can be changed. It starts with assessment. We've already heard, um, Rashad, I think it was you that mentioned that we need to assess. We need to know where the need is the greatest. And once we know where that need is greatest, we need to support the resources in the school for prevention and early intervention where the students are. We cannot wait. 
We need to do like Anoka and Hennepin school districts with Hazel and Betty Ford doing in-school assessment, but then equipping and supporting evidence-based prevention and early intervention to target those individuals who are at need. We've heard the impact that this is having on the families and their, their ch children. I'm the father of three boys, college, navigating college in this era of COVID-19 and seeing how nothing is the same and everything is more stressful than it once was. With the social isolation and the loneliness and the school disruptions, we need evidence-based tools to create social connections in real relationships between teachers and teachers, parents and teachers and the students. Programs like one that you're familiar with, uh, the BAR uh, program, Building Assets, Reducing R Risk, which we deliver across Minnesota and the country. Many of you are in districts where that is in the school. And we know through the outcome metrics that that can engage students and keep them in school. But perhaps at this time, equally important, it connects teachers with teachers to give them that support when they are struggling with this pandemic. But so much more needs to be done. Um, we've uh, worked to try to fill this need with the children's program and our family programs delivered virtually and through donor support fully uh, of no charge. So those of you who are on this call, if there are families in need struggling with a substance use disorder, please know that those are free services. But again, we have to work together because that's not enough. We need and can do more. I will leave you with the results of another study that was recently published. It was a large review that included over 50,000 individuals. It looked across multiple prior studies of how isolation and loneliness affects adolescents and their mental health. And it showed clearly that loneliness, and specifically the duration rather than the intensity of loneliness, increases mental health diagnoses, especially depression, for as much as nine years past the pandemic or other social social disruption. If we do not act now, and I urge this committee and the legislature to listen to all of the stories that we've heard with the, from, from the parents. These are real live stories. And again, from the work that, that we have done in treatment and then across the country in schools, working with parents and teachers and students, the same conclusion is made. We have to be doing assessments in the schools, identifying the need, and then supporting with evidence-based resources to, for prevention and early intervention to change the trajectory so that chronic lifelong substance use disorders and mental health disorders do not occur. This is the time we all need to work together. Our kids need us. We can't lose this opportunity. And I thank you so much for this opportunity to testify with you today. I'm honored to have been a part to hear all of the parents. Um, and again, as a parent, my, my heart goes out to all of the parents who have testified. We do need to provide more support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. DeLisi. And uh, I guess that was time. <laughs> that was a great, great, great opinion to, to wrap up actually to kind of get some idea of where we're going to get help and some idea of a path to follow because we are struggling with, with the, you had mentioned just incidentally, the uh, last 10 years and how those uh, uh, mental health and yes. side issues have increased. There's another issue we're going to address later in, in January, but it's, it is uh, something we're going to have to try to tackle. It's tricky and difficult, but I, I appreciate your comments. Good way to wrap up and uh, good to know Thank you. resources out there. I want to follow up with what um, <laughs> you're doing in Oka Hennepin County. Anoka, Hennep Anoka Hennepin School District. So with that, thank you, Dr. Christine, members. I know that thank you. Senator Isaacson had a question or a comment. Why don't we just wrap up with that and then we'll see if anybody else has something short to offer. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, can you hear me okay? Yep, I got you. All right, great. Uh, I heard a lot of really compelling stuff today uh, and, and some really uh, very poignant emotional stories about what we're experiencing at home with our kids. Uh, 
my days aren't much different from what they heard. You know, I spent this morning uh, working two kids through distance learning and a four-year-old who just wants attention uh, and a 20-week-old puppy who also wants attention. That one's more of a self-inflicted chaos. But the rest of it, uh, while trying to be on a webinar for redistricting, uh, that's a nationwide webinar that I should be paying attention to, and having the opportunity to try to learn and do my job while also helping my kids learn, it's, uh, it's very challenging. And watching my kids pray for COVID to go away because they want to see their friends again, I resonate with all of the things that people are talking about there. And I, I think there's two points I want to make. One is, in many ways, I feel like COVID is just revealing a lot of the inequities we have already in our system, uh, especially uh, with folks that are socioeconomically segregated from our economy and, and uh, 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 the ability to be successful and have the, you know, the promise, the opportunity to pursue happiness, right? We don't, we're, people are not in that position and we're putting them in even a worse spot. Uh, but I want to be clear about one thing. Uh, when I sit here and I'm at home with my kids all day because my wife has to go take care of her dad who just got home from a lung transplant and I can't go to the Capitol because I've got to make sure I quarantine uh, away so I keep, don't give him and put him at risk. Uh, I'm not over here thinking to myself, that I think the Republicans are to blame or the Democrats are to blame or a union's to blame. I want to be really clear. The problem is that we're in a pandemic situation, right? And that's, that's the reality and people are dying. And we see the research coming out now. We've been in this situation for about a year and we see the research coming out now that's showing some of the things we're talking about with our kids and we're seeing some of the damage that's happening from the social isolation as the last speaker talked about, right? And I think moving forward, it would be really helpful to have this conversation in a way that talks about how are we going to solve this problem going forward. But when I hear people just dropping verbal bombs at the teachers' unions or at whoever else they want to talk about, it's really tough to take them seriously when they also talk about some of the other important empathetic things that are, are important for us to hear. I feel like it gets kind of lost in the mess. And so I'm excited and committed to seeing ourselves really find ways to provide as much support for local control in our school districts, financing some of the assessments they talked about, putting teachers in a position to be successful and students in a position where they can try to recapture some of what they lost. And I hope that is the focus of this committee as we move forward. And if it is, I'm looking forward to rolling my sleeves up and working with you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for letting me have a few comments. I appreciate it. Senator Chamberlain, it looked like you said something, but you're muted. The ultimate error. Hey, Senator Isaacson, who had the lung transplant? My uh, father-in-law had it uh, three weeks ago. He got home yesterday, uh, and it's been a smashing success. But um, can't be around anybody. You know, mm -hmm. he, he's got to be. You know, he's on autoimmune suppressants, yeah. drugs, and so yeah. he can't be around folks that are uh, nope. the common cold. Even you know. So. No. Okay. Well. Good luck. To, uh, he's doing well. Him. Really well. We're very pleased and. Uh, very grateful. Thank you for thank right. mentioning it. Thank you. So, uh, members, we are a little over time, but uh, anyone else have a uh, members have a closing comment? Senator Duckworth. Thank you, and, and I'll be very brief. Um, uh, thank you to everybody that came and shared your stories. Uh, many of them very personal. And a special thank you to Melissa, Kyle, Thad. I know I've spoken with many of you uh, before previous to this meeting, but uh, appreciate all the advocacy that you're doing behind the scenes on this. Uh, to Senator Isaacson's point, I think the the one thing that certainly is not lost in all this messaging, no matter where you find yourself uh, politically or any spectrum, is that our kids are are suffering in many ways. It's a challenge, um, and I, I think focusing on solutions and how we move forward, giving both students, families, teachers, our communities some sort of awareness of what we're looking to do or what the plan is to eventually move them back to some sense of normalcy in the classroom is critically important. Uh, so we appreciate you continuing to, to bring the awareness about this. I just uh, wrapped up being a school board member. So I've seen the emails, I've received the phone calls and I know that the hurt and the pain is real and it's a significant challenge. And uh, we can only say that we hear you so many times. Uh, we can only express that we empathize with you so many times and at some point we on your behalf and on the behalf of uh, students all across the state of Minnesota have to take action and do better in terms of providing them quality education and uh, understanding all the second and third order effects that are taking uh, that are taking place in addition to the quality of their education that's being impacted so 
thank you for that. And thank you for bringing that awareness to this committee as we all together, regardless of party, regardless of where we find ourselves in the state, try to find a way forward on behalf of our kids. Thank you very much, Senator Duckworth. Um, uh, any other members? Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to echo Senator Duckworth's uh, statement, statement and comments and thank all of our testifiers today. I especially appreciate hearing from all the mothers today and how it's been a struggle for not only your students, but for you as well. Um, Ms. Palkier, you hit on an issue I'm very passionate about. That we're seeing an entire generation of women right now leaving the workforce so that they can educate their children at home. And that's going to have devastating effects. Uh, for years to come. And that's not even hitting on the issue of the devastating effect that's going to happen to the students uh, for years to come. So thank you for bravely sharing your stories. Um, as Senator Duckworth mentioned right now, we can only say we hear you, but know that we are working uh, towards a solution for this. And please keep sharing your stories. Our uh, ears and our inboxes and our phones are, are open. So thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Senator Coleman. Um, yeah, I, I can't really add any more to that. It was uh, good to hear from all of you, broad range of problems. And um, that's why we're kicking off today and not next week to uh, work through these issues and get it done. We, there has to be a way to get the kids back and do it safely. It just has to. And in the process, we have to tackle this mental health issue as well. So I uh, appreciate it that we're here. Call if you have any thoughts, comments, or ideas. And uh, now that we have all your numbers, we can reach out and get all of you and bug you all the time as well. And uh, maybe you'll never do this again. So thank you with, with that. Thank you, God bless you, take care, uh, good luck. And we will stay on this and we intend to do whatever we can to get it fixed. So uh, call, contact us anytime. Thank you members and testifiers and amazing staffers sitting around with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, we are adjourned. Have a good day. Thank you.